This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1080, recorded on January 17th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from South America, Daniel Griffin. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah, basically, I'm about 20 miles north of Venezuela, so that's, uh, yeah, I'm a bit south, and uh, I guess we're recording this pretty late in my my time zone at the moment, but uh, let's let's get into it, because people will be listening to this, well, I guess, what is it, East Coast right after midnight, and then everyone else adjusted accordingly. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a quotation. I'm I'm having a little bit of a break, so I've been reading the book Dune. So my quotation will come from Frank Herbert. The beginning of knowledge is the discovery of something we do not understand. Um, and I sort of like that. I mean, it made me think of, of science. It's... Uh, you know that humility of going into the unknown and 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 learning, right? I mean, that's that's what I think this is all about. So we will jump right into RSV. Um, we were a little worried. I was a little worried. I'll I'll share that we might see one of those little double dips where um, RSV starts to go down, and then we see another. And so we, we saw that second peak, and and we're hoping um, in the next week or two we really come off that that high level of of RSV. So you know, just keep talking to people about this. We, we have tools this year. Um, we have those two different vaccines for adults, uh, for uh, pregnant individuals in the last trimester. We've got the nirsevimab, the, the passive vaccination. So, um, you know, just, just want to point out, we, we will probably lose over 10,000 adults uh, this winter. We typically lose 100 to 300 children. So um, if we don't use the tools, we, we can't get those numbers down. I also want to move into flu. We we may be coming off the peak, and there's some interesting um, there's interesting studies that we've seen in the past where you know once we get past these these holidays and all the gatherings, uh, sometimes those numbers can come down. Um, a little bit of a twist, and sometimes a challenge is when all the kids go back to school, we can again see a little bit of a of a persistence. So we'll, we'll see what happens here in the coming weeks. But um, flu activity all across the country um, is basically up at uh, pretty significant levels. Except somehow, what's going on in Minnesota? How are they still in the minimal level? I don't know what's going on up there. But <laughs> most of our country, we're seeing lots and lots of influenza. And what about COVID? Um, we are still at over 2,000 deaths a week. Um, and I was recently on the Brian Lair show, and I just want to put this in context. Um, you know, the number of folks in hospital has gone up. We've got about 30,000 in hospital. That's up about 10%. Um, we've got about 3,000 in the ICU. That's also up about 10% from a week ago. Um, new deaths this last week, over 2,000. Um, I don't know if people remember, but at one point we were having 2,000 deaths a day in New York alone back in the in the early days. Um, so, but 2,000 deaths a week in the entire country is still way too many. Just start adding up those weeks, and you know, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, eight to 10,000 a month. Um, but I do think if we're looking at our wastewater data, um, we do seem to be coming off uh, off a peak here, uh, particularly in the Northeast. Really looks like we're heading down and we're seeing things starting to drop in other parts of the country. But I, I will point out we're starting to drop from this this new high set point of uh, 2,500 copies per milliliter of sewage. All right. I got quite a bit this week on children, COVID, and other vulnerable populations, as well as long COVID. So let's get right into it. Um, I like to remind people of the article, Coronavirus is Bad, Comparing it to the Flu is Worse by Re Roxanne Comsey, February of 2020. Can you believe how quickly that came out? Um, well, one of the issues with regard to children and COVID is this minimizing of COVID in children um, by comparing it to adults. So over a thousand children, um, we estimate, died of COVID here in the U.S. Um, but people say, oh, but over a million adults. I, I don't think the fact that over a million adults died makes over a thousand children having died of COVID um, less significant, less troublesome. Um, 
Here, we have the article, Outcomes of SARS-CoV-2 and Seasonal Viruses Among Children Hospitalized in Brazil. Um, in this population-based retrospective cohort study um, that included children and adolescents hospitalized um, from February 2020 to February 2023 from SARS, um, the investigators looked at a total of 235,000 829 patients that available results of viral tests with SARS-CoV-2 predominance, um, and they're going to look at competing risk survival, um, and they're going to estimate the probability of a fatal outcome. So these are folks with acute respiratory um, infections. Not all of them um, have COVID, as you'll see, um, but the fatal outcome for in-hospital mortality, so this is children and adolescents in hospital mortality with SARS-CoV-2, 6.5%. Co-infection, I think this is something that hopefully people are getting more used to looking for, 3.4%. And no virus, 2.9%. Influenza, 2.3%. Other viruses, 2.1%. And actually RSV um, in the children and adolescent, 1.8%. All right, what do we do? Well, fortunately, we have vaccines, and they work. The article, COVID-19 Vaccine Effectiveness Among Adolescents, was recently published in Pediatrics. Uh, so these are results from a nationwide register-based one-to-one matched cohort conducted in Denmark, mm. Finland, Norway, and Sweden between May 28, 2021 and April 30th, 2023, to estimate vaccine efficacy for primary COVID-19 vaccine two-dose schedules among adolescents aged 12 to 17 years, cumulative incidence of what type of efficacy COVID-19-related hospitalization, that was a primary outcome, and laboratory-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, that's a secondary outcome, were compared for the vaccinated and unvaccinated at six months of follow-up. The study included 526,966 primary schedule vaccinated adults. Vaccine efficacy against COVID-19-related hospitalization was 72.6% at six months of follow-up compared with unvaccinated. Estimates were comparable when restricting to a period of Omicron predominance and extending follow-up to 12 months. Um, and they have a really nice figure where you can actually look at the different countries um, and the time. Um, so Finland, Sweden, um, Denmark. So Daniel, you uh, yeah. you said adults, but you meant adolescents there. Oh, did I say it? <laughs> so uh, yes, yeah. adolescents. Yeah, thank you. Okay, not only do vaccines work for kids to protect against acute issues, uh, but we also have the article that I think a lot of people um, hopefully will find interesting, Vaccine Effectiveness Against Long COVID in Children, published in Pediatrics. Uh, so here, the adjusted vaccine effectiveness within 12 months was 35% against probable long COVID in a retrospective cohort study that used data from 17 health systems that looked at 1,037,936 children. Um, I also want to talk in the same section about the article, Socio-Emotional Development of Infants and Toddlers During the COVID-19 Pandemic, published in JAMA Pediatrics. Um, and I think people may remember from the early days my suggestion of perhaps we should close the bars and open the schools. Well, the background of this study, as the authors point out, is that the COVID-19 pandemic and its related social distancing um, negatively affected children and families. Caregiver stress increased, which can negatively affect infant development and health. Children's screen time increased, uh, which we have prior studies showing us associated with poor language, problem solving, and social development. Daycare and preschool closures, along with social distancing, decreased peer interactions for young children. Um, and they're going to give you uh, links to all the different articles um, supporting that. Um, but here, while studies suggest young children's socio-emotional development was affected during the pandemic, um, assessments specifically designed um, to evaluate the socio-emotional development, changes in screening results over time, referrals to early intervention have not been examined. Well, prior to this, here they used specific validated early childhood development assessments and looked at 60,171 families 
and found that the pandemic contributed to delays in young children's social-emotional development, particularly uh, during the first year of life. Not surprising, right, Daniel? Yeah, I don't think any of this is surprising. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things people always talk about, oh, what, what can we do better? What, what lessons did we learn from this pandemic? And we're going to talk about some machine learning looking at that next time. Um, but I think we really failed our children in a lot of ways. Uh, so I think that, you know, we, we, need to, yeah. we need to look really closely at that and see how we can do a better job next time. All right, I will move on to COVID, the early viral phase. Um, a little bit of a teaser, Vincent. Uh, next time, I'm going to be discussing a preprint um, out of the David Ho Lab with uh, with Yossi uh, Sabo as one of the mm. uh, one of the co-authors. Um, I've been waiting for this to come out because I've been aware of this data now for actually a couple of years. <laughs> Yossi swore me to silence, mm. uh, so now that the preprint is out, we'll talk a little bit about viral kinetics. Um, but let's talk about uh, Paxlovid. So early viral phase, you test positive, um, you meet one of the criteria for being high risk. Uh, NIH treatment guidelines recommend Paxlovid. And there's a really nice news piece in the New York Times by Danny Bloom. I have COVID. Should I take Paxlovid? Um, several good points that bear repeating. Um, when they look at who is a candidate, they note that anyone 12 or older who is considered high risk, which encompasses a broad swath of persons, the CDC includes conditions such as depression, obesity, asthma, history of smoking. Um, they, they asked Dr. Davy Smith, an infectious disease specialist at the University of California, San Diego, and I quote, to be honest, pretty much if you're an adult in the U.S., you can meet one of these little marks. Anyone aged 50 or older is also eligible for the treatment, regardless of health status. The older you are, the higher your risk for severe illness tends to be. Um, and, I, and I like this. Paxlovid is intended for people with mild or moderate symptoms, right? I'm gonna, my little ad is you don't wait for someone to be severely ill. Take it as early as possible to nip it in the bud and prevent yourself from being so sick, said Dr. Ziad Ali Alai the Chief of Research and Development of the Veterans Affairs of St. Louis Healthcare System. Even if you currently have few symptoms or if you've had mild symptoms with COVID before, the disease is unpredictable and you may still want to consider Paxlovid if you're eligible. Dr. Smith said, every time someone gets COVID, it's basically another game of roulette, he said. What about Paxlovid rebound? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found no consistent association between antiviral treatment and rebound. And as we have from the CDC. So, Daniel, the. Uh, yes. Sorry. No, no, go there's ahead. A, uh, you f there's a, okay. also an article curious. in the Washington Post. Yes. Um, by Leanna when the underprescribing of Paxlovid may be our biggest po COVID policy failure. And that's really good, also. Okay. Excellent. We should let's. Can you throw a link into that for our readers? That would be great. Yeah, yeah I will. All right. So, we will move on to. Um, a little bit about um, cost and access. Um, so I was on NPR Monday on the Brian Lair show, um, and a woman called in sharing that her husband had been charged $1,683 for a box of Paxlovid. Um, and one of the challenges is Paxlovid is now just like every other medicine where you go to the pharmacy and they run your insurance. And if you have prescription coverage, you end up either paying a copay or finding out that, that this is not covered. Um, now, there is a link to a program called Paxess. I don't know who came up with that, but it's catchy, P-A-X-C-E-S-S, -S, um, for those not insured or those with Medicare or Medicaid. Um, and we can leave in a link to Paxess. Um, but to qualify for free Paxlovid through this program until December 31, 2024, patients must be uninsured and do not have a prescription benefit uh, prescription drug benefit at the time they fill their prescription, uh, Medicare beneficiaries, Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, and you can either go to the website, which is this www.paxlovid.com forward slash Paxess, or you can call 1-877-219-7225. Because um, really, I, I don't want to see this happen. I don't want to see someone acutely have COVID, meet criteria, um, be a person who potentially can benefit and then have this, this financial wall between them and the access to the medicine. 
Uh, number two, remdesivir. Number three, malnupiravir. Um, and then convalescent plasma for some folks, such as those immunocompromised um, at risk of progression who are not eligible for other options. And then week number two, the cytokine storm week, right? You're feeling crummy the first week, and then you feel crummy that second week. What is going on that second week? This is the early inflammatory phase, the cytokine storm, a period of time when we have studied antivirals for years and years and never shown that this is a great time to do that. Um, some folks, steroids at the right time, in the right patient, at the right dose. And so I want to just spend a little time because a few questions came up here, right? So you made it past day seven, your patient is feeling crummy, they're in the early inflammatory phase. Do we just give everyone steroids? It'll make them feel a little better. better. Remember, people after a virus are at an increased risk of a post-viral bacterial infection. So if we start throwing steroids willy-nilly, if we're not following those pulse oximeter readings, if we're not finding the highest risk folks, we're actually potentially going to harm our patients. So be careful with those steroids. Let's use them in an evidence-based manner. Dexamethasone, six milligrams a day times six days in folks with oxygen saturations less than 94%. Um, anticoagulation guidelines um, recommended for folks that end up in the hospital. We have great recommendations from American Society of Hematology to help guide us. Um, pulmonary support, remdesivir are still in the first 10 days. Immune modulation, um, avoid unnecessary antibiotics and unproven therapies. And as promised, I've actually got quite a bit here, late phase past long COVID. Um, so just to put this simply, and I don't know how many times this bears repeating, PASC or long COVID, this is a thing. It is not just in people's head. Um, some people have very low serotonin levels or low cortisol levels or evidence of latent viral reactivation, such as the herpes viridae or muscle damage with mitochondrial dysfunction and a number of papers showing ongoing immune dysfunction. So this week, the paper, Long COVID manifests with T-cell dysregulation, inflammation, and an uncoordinated adaptive immune response to SARS-CoV-2 was published in Nature Immunology. This paper really requires some time. It's complicated, requires a solid background in immunology to fully understand. Um, I'll share, share an overview, and perhaps Vincent and I can discuss the implications. So. The authors explain that they used omic assays and serology to deeply characterize the global and SARS-CoV-2 specific immunity in the blood of individuals with clear long COVID and non-long COVID clinical trajectories eight months post-infection. They found that long COVID individuals exhibited systemic inflammation, immune dysregulation evidenced by global differences in T-cell subset distribution implying ongoing immune responses as well as by sex-specific perturbations in cytolytic subsets. Long COVID individuals displayed increased frequencies of CD4 positive T cells poised to migrate to inflamed tissues and exhausted SARS-CoV-2 specific CD8 positive T cells, higher levels of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, and a miscoordination between their SARS-CoV-2 specific T and B cell responses. Their analysis suggested an improper crosstalk between the cellular and humoral adaptive immunity in long COVID, which can lead to immune dysregulation, inflammation, and clinical symptoms associated with this debilitating condition. Um, every figure is complicated with multiple panels, and there are supplemental figures as well. But for example, in figure one, we see elevated T central memory, T effective memory, peripheral T follicular helper, and flea and follicular helper and Tregs. In figure two, we see increased homing receptor expression, um, perhaps associated, as they say, with migration to inflamed tissue. Um, in figure three, we see that SARS-CoV-2 specific CD8 positive T cells from individuals with long COVID preferably express the exhaustion markers, such as CTLA4. And figure four, we see this excessive production of anti- uh, receptor binding domain antibodies. And figure five, um, we see that in long COVID, IL-4 is up, IL-5 is down. So lots of differences. Um, and this all seems to be, seems to make biological sense. But is this data mining? Should we repeat this in different cohorts? 
Um, and what are the diagnostic or therapeutic implications? Daniel, um, each of these figures, they're dot plots, where each dot is a patient, right? Yes. There's huge overlap between the long COVID and the other popu the control population, right? So, yeah, and there are some patients who clearly have higher uh, of, of whatever they're looking at, anti-RBD, for example. But then there are many patients whose anti-RBD are the same as in the control population. So I don't think it's everyone that's having the same issue if this is, in fact, the issue. Yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the tough things. And I think, you know, as a clinicians, we look at this and we want to see two different groups. Like, you know, like we saw with the data out of UPenn with low serotonin, we want to see like a whole group of people or the people with low mm -hmm. cortisol, as we saw out of the Mount Sinai Yale study. We want to see the two groups really separate. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges where we're starting to see that the two groups are biologically different, um, but we're not really getting that distinction. And yes, I actually think this goes along with the line that long COVID is probably a number of different processes going on. And not every long COVID patient has the same mechanism driving their issues. I would be very interested to know if the dots are the same patients who are similar to the controls and in each of the assays that they do, right? So anti-RBD, PD-1, CTLA-4, is it always the same patient that's higher? Or is it a mixed bag, in which case it would be very difficult to know what's going on? Yeah, I would love that too. That would be great. Like I know they're sort of comparing here the, the blue dots to the red dots, but yeah, it'd be great yeah. if there's some way to turn on like that third dimension of, you know, give us, give us a red green or something. We could see which person is which. And I am hoping, you know, as we get a better understanding of the different drivers for different people, that's going to drive us. You know, if someone has a serotonin um, of like six or eight, I'm going to come up with a plan. If someone has a cortisol, which is in a certain area, if someone has evidence of mast cell activation or histamine driven symptoms, or maybe we can get a better subtlety here of what might be a way to address each individual instead of just throwing stuff at these debilitated people and potentially making them feel worse at times. And the next one, I guess I will talk about is a couple, a uh, couple investigations looking at vaccination to prevent long COVID and vaccination to treat long COVID. Um, and so the first is the article, The Effectiveness of COVID-19 Vaccines to Prevent Long COVID Symptoms, Staggered Cohort Study of Data from the UK, Spain, and Estonia, published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Here, the investigators conducted a staggered cohort study. Right? So they're starting them at different times, these different cohorts, um, using primary care records from the UK, um, from Catalonia, Spain, um, from Estonia, um, and they end up finding that compared with unvaccinated individuals, overall hazard ratios for long COVID symptoms in people vaccinated with the first dose of any COVID-19 vaccine ranged from 0 0.49 to 71. So think about it as a 29 to 51% reduction and it consistently was associated with a reduced risk of persistent symptoms after a COVID infection. Now, I'll even links to some other studies as well, but what about vaccination as a therapeutic for long COVID? Um, so I'm going to discuss the preprint impact of COVID-19 vaccination on symptoms and immune phenotypes in vaccine-naive individuals with long COVID, recently posted on MedArchive. Um, there's a number of August authors there. We have Connor P. Bradley, uh, Connor B. Bradley, sorry about that, Connor. Um, Akiko's in there, Harlan Krumholtz is in there. I see Daniel Griffin misspelled in there. Um, I'll leave in the link. <laughs> I'll leave in a, a link to a thread uh, posted by Akiko Iwasaki that kind of walks through this. But I have to say, this was a, this was a challenging study to, um, to enroll for because what we were looking for here is participants with long COVID who had not been vaccinated, who would then agree to be in this study. Um, and then they would go ahead and they would get a COVID vaccine dose. And then later they would get a second COVID vaccine dose. Uh, before they got the vaccination, uh, we would collect blood, saliva. They would do a survey, get their first dose. They'd do another survey, get the second dose. Again, blood, saliva, survey. And then we follow them out uh, about three months, more blood, saliva, survey. Um, and it's going to be a lot of stuff that, that gets done here. 
Um, lots of pretty multicolored figures, but I'm going to jump right to figure two. Um, what, what was really happening as far as just symptoms? When you ask these people, how are you doing? How are you doing at two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks? Um, so when we look at two weeks, we have about 43% feeling better, six weeks, 79%. 12 weeks, we actually lose a few, and we're down to 62%. Um, 20%, 14 and 19% say they're about the same. Um, this is what I want to point out, is at two weeks, 7% were worse. When we go to six weeks, 7% were worse. And actually, at 12 weeks, 19% were worse. So not everyone felt better. We actually had some people feel worse. So what I would love to do, and we'll go a little further into this, is be able to tell ahead of time, right? Because here we are, we're encouraging people, you know, hey, most people get better, 80, 60%, um, but some people actually are feeling worse. So jumping to figure four, this is the anal analysis of the vaccination response to the immune system, changes to antibodies against EBV and other viruses in response to COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and you do see a little bit of a difference, but not really. We're not really seeing a big difference here in those that are improved, those who are worse. Supplementary figure two, autoantibody analysis. Um, and I think this is a big one that I think is probably the second, um, but, but several here, where the idea that autoantibody is somehow um, related and maybe changes in this, um, we really don't see um, any changes. Autoantibody levels really stay stable. Um, what's going up is the, um, the spike antibody levels post-vaccine. Um, now, this one I liked as it might predict responders to vaccination. Um, so here we have figure five, the results of examining plasma factors that are enriched in those who improved after vaccination versus those who did not. So the heat map shows that soluble IL-6 receptor elevated at baseline and after the vaccine in those who improved. In contrast, interferon beta and the ciliary neurotrophic factor were elevated in those who did not improve after vaccination. So there may be ways for us to tell ahead of time um, who's going who's gonna to get better. Now, plasma levels of interferons, alpha-2 and beta, CNTF, IL-11, SCF, so stem cell factor, were consistently higher in those who did not improve after vaccination, while soluble IL-6 receptor was consistently higher in those who reported health improvement after vaccination. So, you know, this will undergo its peer review and it'll come out hopefully better than it is currently. Um, but starting to see maybe some of the biology um, hopefully help us. Because the last thing I want to do is encourage someone who's debilitated by long COVID to go get a vaccination and have them feel worse. And what we're seeing here is that that is a risk. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are feeling better, but some people are worse. All right. And as I have been finishing um, every episode for quite a while, I'm going to keep this one short because we, I already tell you, we've got a lot coming next, next week. No one is safe until everyone is safe. We're in the middle of January. We're getting to the end of our Microbe TV fundraiser, November, December, and January. We will double your donations up to a potential maximum donation of $20,000. So stop what you're doing. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click donate. Even a small amount Every bit helps us continue our work. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Joanne writes, I have a question about the boosters. I've had each vaccine that has been offered, six or seven, I can't remember. I'm up to date. Had my last shot in October 2023. Would like to get another at the end of January, which would be four months out. I'm 78 with COPD, diabetes, heart disease, etc. I have not had COVID and I'm hoping not to get it. I mask indoors. My thought is I would like to keep my immune system primed as much as possible. What do you think of my plan? You know, it makes a lot of sense. Sounds like you've been listening to TWIF. Um, you know, what we've talked about with the vaccines um, is that each time you get a booster, you know, call it a new vaccine, call it a booster, but each time you get one of these shots for, we estimate three to four months, you're going to get an elevated level of those antibodies. Um, 
you're going to get that extra level of protection. Um, antibodies can track. That's just what they do. Now, as a public health policy, I don't think we're going to be able to convince everyone that, hey, in this new world, now that COVID is with us, you need to get a shot every four months. Um, but I think certain individuals will will want to do that. It makes sense. These are licensed vaccines. That's certainly something you and your um, physician can discuss. Um, and I certainly understand the science and the thinking behind that. Ellen writes, a friend of mine who completed the initial series of three vaccinations has contracted COVID five times, twice in the past 90 days. How is this possible? In the meantime, her partner, with whom she shares a bed, has never had it. She took Paxlovid once in the past, claims it made her feel worse. She also lost her hair during a previous infection, occasional numbness on the left side of her face, ongoing pain in the right calf. This time, her doctor recommended she go to urgent care for COVID vaccination despite her debilitating fatigue and headache. Was this good advice? Yeah, so first, my heart goes out to people like this. Unfortunately, there are people who have repeated infections who, as we've discussed, um, are not fully recovered after these infections. Um, you know, we've talked about how devastating um, losing your hair can be. Um, and it is tough, right? As, as we talked about that article, um, each time you get COVID, it, it's Russian roulette. You know, people who it was a mild case, they weathered the storm. Three months later, I'm taking care of them in the hospital because something about, you know, maybe their genetics, uh, who knows what, but each time can be different. So a mild case doesn't necessarily mean the next time you get COVID is going to be mild as well. Um, and that's always a tough thing. You know, people say, oh, I took Paxlovid and it was worse. Well, what was worse? Were you continuing to have, um, you know, COVID-19? How would this have been without Paxlovid? And we really don't get to do that. Um, yeah, the challenge is, um, you know, when do you get that next vaccine? Sort of coming to your last question. Um, and really frustrating for folks that get COVID. And we're recommending wait 90 days before you get that vaccine. And then they got COVID again. And they're sort of wondering, how do I ever get that 90 days? Um, this is where we've got to start talking about behavioral modification. Um, what's possibly going on? What are the exposures? You know, five COVID infections. Um, it's worth spending a little time trying to figure out um, there's some way to mitigate that exposure um, and actually get vaccines instead of getting boosted with the infection and all the risks that come with that. Lori writes, um, and this is about Paxess. I wrote to you a few days ago about my sister's difficulty in getting Paxlovid. As it turns out, she needed to fill out an application with Paxess. Pfizer evidently subsidizes the cost for eligible patients. Hopefully others may benefit from this information. So this is what you also mentioned above. Oh, excellent. Thank Daniel. you. And finally, Kathleen writes, Kathleen is a hairstylist in Dallas, Texas, who's been listening to TWIF since 2020 and is a big fan. A friend of mine recently tested positive for COVID on December 20th. She cleared her infection, and yes, she did get to take Paxlovid, Today is January 11, and she tested positive again. This is the fastest reinfection I have ever thought possible. I know you can have multiple infections. However, it seems to me this immediate reinfection may indicate no short period of a relief immediately after an infection anymore. I'm not a scientist, but I do have a large load in the common sense department. <laughs> COVID continues to keep my attention and my concern. Yeah, now this is, again, this is the frustration. Um, and uh, what one of our earlier emails wrote about, too, is some individuals not even getting that, you know, thinking, oh, I just had COVID. At least I probably won't get it for the next three months. Well, unfortunately, people are getting reinfected. Some folks within the same month, they get COVID and then they get it again. And verifying it's, it's, a, it's a reinfection because it might even be a different variant. So uh, very, very frustrating. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.